This is part four in our series of lectures on section 4.3, and in this lecture I'm going to give you another example involving surjectivity. Let's consider the function from the Cartesian product of the natural numbers with itself into the set of natural numbers. We're going to define f of m comma n to be 2 to the m minus 1 times 2n minus 1. And the exercise is for you to prove that f is onto, that it is a surjective function. So before we jump in and try to do the proof, let's have a look at this function uh, in order to get a feel for what this function is telling us. So what, what we want to do is, in order to prove that it's surjective, we have to give ourselves a typical natural number, and we have to prove that it can be written in this form for some appropriate choice of m and n. So what is this 2 to the m minus 1, and what is this 2n minus 1? Well, it's telling us that we want to be able to write some given s in the natural numbers in this form, it's saying that it can be written as a power of 2 multiplied by something that is odd. So why should we believe that it's possible to write any natural number as a power of 2 multiplied by something that's odd? Now you'll notice, by the way, that this is m minus 1. m is taken in the set of natural numbers, so if m were 1, then this wouldn't appear and it would just simply be odd. So in the case that the s is actually odd, um, we could choose our m to be 1 in order to get rid of this factor, and we would just be saying that s can be written in the form 2n minus 1 for, for some appropriate choice of n. And of course, we know that we can do that if, if s is odd. On the other hand, if s is even, then there must be some power of 2 um, that divides it. So what you do is you take the biggest possible power of 2 that divides it, then what remains after you do that division is probably some kind of an odd number, and so that's that's where the 2n minus 1 comes in. So it does look reasonable that this should be true. So the question is how to argue it, and there are various ways to do it, but one is um, just to make use of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, because fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells you that you can always write s as a product of primes, so this factor here would be um, all of the factors of 2 that appear in the prime factorization, and all of the other primes are odd, and so if you multiply a bunch of odd numbers together, you expect to get something that's odd. And so that's, um, so if you decide to use the, prime, uh, the um, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that's, that, that's an argument that you should be able to make work. So that's the uh, route that I'm going to use in my proof. And so I'd like you to use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic also in writing up your proof of this theorem. So go ahead and see if you can make that argument work. Here is the formal, here is the uh, definition of the given function. And I want you to show that this particular function is onto and make use of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic in order to do it. Put your video on pause, give it a try, and uh, I'll show you my proof when you come back. Well, here's the beginning of the proof. Uh, and recall what it is we're, we have to do. This is just merely the definition of the function up here. We're trying to prove that it's onto, so you have to look back at the definition of onto and read that definition from left to right. You have to give yourself an element here, and you have to prove that there exists something in your domain which maps to that element. So you start by giving yourself an S in the set of natural numbers. Um, so by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we know that S can be written uniquely as a product of primes. Let's let j denote the number of factors of 2 which appear in that prime factorization. So that um, j could conceivably be 0. There may not be any factors of 2, um, or there may be some non-trivial factors of 2. So we let m be j plus 1. So in the special case that j is equal to 0, m would be 1, which is still a natural number. Now we have to consider three cases depending upon how many factors 
of 2 appear in the prime factorization. So case 1 is the case where 2 is the only prime that appears in the prime factorization of s. In other words, s is equal to 2 to the j. So in that case, I'm going to choose my number n to be 1. So now I have um, m. m is already chosen. m is equal to j plus 1. So we've got our m. I'm taking n to be 1. And then just observe that s is 2 to the j, which is the same as 2 to the m minus 1 times 1. And that's exactly f of m comma n. So that takes care of case 1. Now, why don't you give case 2 a try yourself? Case 2 is going to be the one where 2 doesn't appear at all in the prime factorization of s. Put your video on, pause, and give that one a try. So in case 2, there are no factors of 2 at all. And um, so that means j is equal to 0, and so we've chosen our m to be 1. But since there are no factors of 2, s must be odd, and therefore we know that there must exist a natural number n such that s is equal to 2n minus 1. So then it follows that s is 2n minus 1, which is the same as 2 to the 0 times 2n minus 1. This 0 is the same as 1 minus 1, and so this is exactly f of mn, right? It's f of 1 comma n, and therefore we've handled case 2 as well. The last case is the case in which there's at least one factor of 2 and at least one um, prime in the prime factorization which isn't uh, 2. So why don't you give that one a try also? Alright, so in this case S has at least one factor of 2 and at least one factor in its prime factorization which is not 2. So let's let t denote the product of all of the non-even primes in the prime factorization. Then t is odd, so there has to exist a natural number n such that t can be written in that form. And therefore s can be written as 2 to the j times t. That's exactly what the prime factorization theorem, or the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells you. But this j is the same as m minus 1, and this t is the same as 2n minus 1, as we've written here. And that's exactly f of mn. So we've handled case 3. So we've shown that given any s in our codomain, we're able to prove that there exists an m and an n in the domain such that f of mn is equal to that s, and therefore f is surjective, and that completes the proof.